In the northern lowlands of Hue, Vietnam, the monsoonal rainforests receive over 125 inches of rainfall per year. Over 1,800 species of plants grow within a space of just 75 square miles. Here, the rain feeds every part of life, and in turn, the atmosphere feeds the rain. Late summer monsoons bring rainfall upwards of two inches per hour, brought by winds over a warming ocean in the South China Sea. The rainfall fuels unimaginable growth within the forest, which in turn brings hotter, moist temperatures and fuels the cycle over and over again, year after year. Three thousand miles away, in the northeast oceans of Australia, the Great Barrier Reef is home to 25% of all known marine species in the world. Far downstream from the winds that fuel the Southeast Asian monsoons, the ocean currents of warm tropical water keep coral reefs alive as offshore waves bring warm temperatures and fresh flow of water. Concentrated at precise depths and distances offshore, the colonies of coral perched on the offshore banks here balance an incredible measurement of temperature, water filtration, wave depth, and ocean currents to survive and give life to cities underwater. Across the globe, nearly every environment on Earth must balance an incredible array of natural forces to survive. From the North Atlantic current in the Canadian North to the sheet flow of the Everglades, there is only one environment ruled by a single natural force. In the desert, there is only one God that rules all. There are many common misconceptions about the desert. The first is that it never rains. It does, just less so than other places. And when it does, it tends to do it all at once. In the southwestern US state of Arizona, the late summer months of July through September bring monsoon season. For a little over two months, Nightly storms bring furious rain, spider webs of lightning, and flash floods across the desert. And then, just as soon as it starts, it ends. And for the rest of the year, the sun rules all. In the jungle of northern Vietnam, it can rain up to two inches in an hour. In the Sonoran Desert of Arizona and northern Mexico, it rains 20 inches in a year. The second misconception is that it's always hot. This, also, is only partially true. Life that revolves around the sun is a life of extremes. During the daytime in summer, temperatures in Sonora can easily top excess of 110 degrees, but at night, the opposite holds true. With no water, cloud cover, or excess vegetation to hold on to the heat produced during the day, temperatures in the desert plummet at night. As the heat disperses rapidly after sundown, the desert can see temperature swings of over 30 degrees between day and night. The footage in this documentary was taken in late April, soon after many desert animals emerged from their winter hibernations. It's not quite the extreme temperature of summer yet, but the animals here know it's only a matter of time. The last big misconception is that the desert is a vast, empty place devoid of life. This, unlike the first two, could not be farther from the truth.
The footage in this video was captured in Sonoran Desert National Monument, south of Phoenix, Arizona. The monument here has no headquarters, no entry gate, and no fees. There are two established campgrounds, two bathrooms, and a few established miles of trails for over 750 square miles of protected land. The entire monument is open to access, anywhere, by anyone, and is bisected by part of the Arizona Trail. It is the largest area of protected, untamed Sonoran Desert in America. In the land dominated by temperature exchange, the cycle of hot days and cold nights, the turnover point is critical for life. Dawn and dusk, the precious few hours when the sun rises and sets, are when the desert comes to life. As the sun rises beyond the mountains and the heat begins its journey upwards, the morning begins with a fight. Two male Sonoran-colored lizards, found widely across the Sonoran Desert, are locked in a battle for territory. It's almost May in the desert, and their mating season is about to begin. Sonoran collared lizards are highly defensive animals. They can and will attack physically to defend their territory, but more often than not, they settle their disputes with a different cultural practice, a show of strength. The male on the right has won. As the loser runs off to find a new spot, the winner gives one final display of dominance before settling back into the sand to guard his territory. A few feet away, the loser recuperates and takes some time to plan his next move. At the top of the wash, a pair of side-blotched lizards watch the battle from a distance. Unlike the collared lizards, these two are mates. The one with the bright blue tail is the male. After hibernating for the winter, these lizards mate with a single partner that they remain close with for the spring and summer. Side-blotched lizards have the highest number of distinct morphs of any lizard species found in Sonora, with three different distinctly colored male morphs. The blue males, like the one you see here, are the most territorial of the three. In contrast, the orange males are more nomadic and outgoing, and the yellow males are more stealthy and can blend in with females. A research study by the University of California on side-blotched lizards on the Channel Islands likened the mating pattern of the three types of males to a game of rock-paper-scissors. Orange males, the most aggressive of the three, outcompete the more defensive blue males. The blue male's territorial defensiveness wins over the yellow male's stealthier approach, and in full circle, the yellow males are able to sneak past orange males to win a mate. A Sonoran spotted whiptail lies in wait beneath the brush. Unlike some of the other common lizards here, Sonoran spotted whiptails are only found within a few hundred mile radius of the Sonoran Desert. Whiptail lizards are named so because their tails are often as long or longer than their entire body. Whiptail lizards with tails like these can still lose their tails as a defense mechanism, but do so far less often because of how important their tail is to their balance. Even more interesting is that roughly one-third of whiptail species, including Sonoran-spotted whiptails, reproduce asexually, 
meaning that all Sonoran spotted lizards are female. They do this by producing twice the normal amount of chromosomes in sexual reproductive cells and growing their own eggs, and, incredibly, using double the amount of chromosomes to splice its own genes with itself to create genetic variation in its offspring, unlike most asexual animals which create genetically identical offspring. Whiptail lizards are among the only types of animals in the world who can do this, and the process still has much to tell us about how they live. Like all cold-blooded reptiles, lizards cannot regulate their own body heat and must bask in the sun to warm themselves. In Sonora, there is no shortage of sunlight to go around, and sometimes there can be too much. Many lizards here emerge in the morning to bask in the sun and heat themselves, but as the hours wear on and the temperature rises, the sun becomes too much, and the lizards here must hide in the afternoon in their burrows or under the brush. But even hiding cannot be done for too long. The reptiles here know that at night when the sun disappears, the temperature plummets, and they must build up enough internal body heat before the sunset to last until morning. Hiding near the shade of an old log is a Sonoran zebra-tailed lizard. What you don't see beneath the tail is a magnificent black and white striped band. The exact purpose of the tail is unknown, but based on the way that zebra-tailed lizards can be seen curling their tail up and slowly waving it back and forth, it is believed to be used to confuse predators. If that doesn't work, zebra-tailed lizards are among the fastest lizards in the desert. When the sand gets too hot, they can also occasionally be seen standing on two legs and alternating like a flamingo. In the rising heat of the mid-noon sun, a blue side-blotched lizard defends his burrow. Soon he will likely be inside, burrowing to escape the rising heat. Interstate 8 runs directly through the southern portion of the monument and is one of only two paved roads that run through the monument at all. I-8 provides one of the longest stretches of natural, untamed wilderness of any interstate in the U.S. From the edge of Casa Grande to Gila Bend, there is not a single town, gas station, or functional business of any kind. There are two exits, both of which dead end into Sonoran National Monument trailheads. There are a few spots where people tried to settle that you'll see here and there, but they dried up a long, long time ago.
As the sun peaks in the sky, its rain has only just begun. Fifty thousand feet above the sand below, a tint reflects off of a pair of jets in the open sky. Like much of southern Arizona, the desert here has long been home to one of the largest U.S. Air Force grounds in the country. Sonoran Desert National Monument overlaps partially with Barry M. Goldwater Air Force Range, one of the largest Air Force training grounds in the U.S., where open desert and year-round visibility provide for ideal flying environments. The part of the monument that overlaps with the range is open to visitors who obtain a free permit online, which instructs the safe recognition of old Air Force debris. The desert is a weird place, and the sand tanks are no exception. Though rare, unexploded bombs do exist in the far reaches of the monument. Morning rises again. A few feet away from the tent, a Gila woodpecker is busy at work. Unlike many of the other birds of Sonora who often nest in saguaro cactus in groups with multiple different species, Gila woodpeckers prefer the cactus to themselves. Just like other woodpeckers in traditional trees, Gila woodpeckers carve out a small den within the side of the arms of saguaro to nest inside of. This doesn't hurt the cactus. Instead, it's actually an important mutualistic relationship. The flesh of the saguaro hardens around the woodpecker's den, which provides a sturdy burrow and protects the nest from the rest of the plant. In return for shelter, the Gila woodpecker eats insects that threaten the cactus and prunes dead skin off the cactus to prevent infection. Their mornings are spent circling around the trees surrounding their saguaro, examining their territory and calling out to other woodpeckers. As the day goes on, they may venture farther out to find more insects to eat, before returning to do another sweep of the cactus in the evening and nesting inside overnight.
javelinas. Although they look like small wild pigs, javelinas are actually a type of mammal called pecares, scruffy hooved animals that roam in small packs. They're common on the outskirts of urban areas where they forage for food, but they also thrive in the wild, sort of like the raccoons of the pig kingdom. They aren't too afraid of humans, but they usually won't approach either. They roam the washes of the desert, both in the wild and in urban areas, traveling in small packs and feeding on vegetation and prickly pear fruit. For as loud and scruffy as they are, they can be surprisingly stealthy in the wild. On the top of the dual peaks stands one of the most majestic animals in all of the desert. Once one of the most threatened species in America, a male desert bighorn sheep stands atop the edge of the dual peaks and surveys his domain. It's possible, though I'll never know for sure, that a small herd is standing behind him on the hilltop in this footage. Bighorn sheep are herd animals, usually banding together in groups of eight to ten, though sometimes more. The sheep that live here along the cliff sides of southwestern America are among the most well-adapted desert mammals on Earth. With hooves specifically fitted for climbing jagged rock and mountainsides, the small bands of desert bighorn sheep here spend their time perched in high, rocky outcrops far from the ground. The sheep here frequently go weeks without a permanent water source and have adapted to be able to adjust to changes in their internal body temperature far beyond that of most mammals. It is theorized that desert bighorn sheep are so well adapted to the dryness of the desert that they are able to live not only in places too high for predators to reach, but places too hot for their predators to survive at all. Once numbering in the tens of thousands, bighorn sheep were hunted to less than 9,000 sheep in the early days of western expansion. Their numbers have increased slowly since the 1960s due to habitat preservation and their reintroduction into areas like Zion National Park and today they number in at around 27,000, with the second largest population of them calling Arizona home. The ram here stood atop his rock and watched me for several minutes. If he had a herd behind him that he was defending, he didn't seem too concerned about me, and I didn't make any moves towards him. I sat and watched him for a while, and he stood guard, until eventually I left and let him be, watching over his desert and the buzzards in the interstate in the far distance. Yuma, Arizona, tucked behind the Gila Mountains in the tri-corner of California and Mexico, receives more hours of sunshine per year than any other city on planet Earth. Like many deserts, Yuma is home to the largest abundance of sunshine in the world for agricultural growth, at the cost of water. But unlike most deserts, the Colorado River, which separates Arizona and California, provides thousands of acres of some of the most nutrient-rich soil in North America. This combination, along with various engineering projects to channel water from the Colorado into fields around Yuma, makes Yuma County the third largest vegetable producer in the entire United States. Comparative on a smaller scale to the Nile River Valley in Egypt, the Colorado River feeds the desert oasis around this little town with nutrients to support over 175 different crops. And with an average of 308 out of 365 days of pure sunshine per year and little seasonal temperature change, agriculture in Yuma County produces enough to make up one-third of the entire annual revenue in the state of Arizona. The fields you see here aren't far out into the desert. They are quite literally in town. Like the wilderness of Sonoran National Monument, in Yuma, the sun rules all. And like the animals of Sonora, here, too, the people have adapted to it. On the banks of the Colorado River, the sun finally sets, 
bringing in a precious few hours of dusk. The palm trees you see across the river are in California. The river and the fields of tomatoes here mark not only the end of Arizona, but the near edge of Sonora. The desert extends much farther south, through Mexico and all the way to the Gulf of California. But the western edge of Sonora, at least as it looks in the sand tanks, ends not far past the Colorado and fades into the Mojave to the north and the Colorado Desert to the west. When I decided to go to California for fun, I didn't think I'd end up walking there, but I ended up stumbling across the river at an older bridge crossing. Route 80, the lesser-known brother of Route 66, crosses the Colorado at the single-lane Ocean-to-Ocean Highway Bridge, which gives a perfect view over the trans-state sunset. Downstream just a few miles from here is where the river crosses into Mexico, and far, far to the north is Hoover Dam in the Grand Canyon. Thank you for watching. This is a series I hope to make more of in the future. If you plan on visiting Sonoran Desert National Monument, bring lots of gas and lots of water, and be prepared to be off the grid for a while. I didn't see a single other person in the entirety of hiking or driving through the Maricopa Wilderness. The desert is a harsh and unforgiving place, but tucked beneath the brutality is an oasis of life waiting to be discovered. It's not a place for everyone, but for those who seek it, the beauty here truly can be endless.